we're going this evening to Central America, so if it happens to be a little warm, it's nothing to what you'll find down there. In addition, they have something there which um, is very troublesome called the garapoda. It is a minute tick uh, which gets in under the skin and has to be taken out with the point of a penknife. Combined with the heat, several million of those really make an interesting time of it for all concerned. So perhaps you will forgive the present inconveniences as the lesser of several evils. This evening we have to deal with the Atlantis tradition in the Western Hemisphere. And it is an interesting subject that springs from a great many different roots and has a great many verifications and wanderings as we seek with different tribes for records. I've already mentioned the totemic records in the Northwest, the totem poles of the Canadian Indians, and how these frequently represent the deluge and the salvation of two human beings who were to become the progenitors of a new race. We find a similar record among the Atlantic Coast Indians around the Cumberland Gap area, also further south among the Seminoles. In fact, nearly all of your Atlantic seaboard tribes have legends of one kind or another relating to the existence of a land uh, directly to the east of them. In the original Indian version, Great Rabbit, who uh, later became confused with another man in Longfellow's poem of Hiawatha, a Great Rabbit, leaving his people, took a canoe and returned to the mysterious land of the east, the land that was east to him, out into the Atlantic Ocean. The Seminoles have their account of the land bridge. The old Cherokee people also have interesting accounts of these uh, ancient times. And with the rise of the Iroquois League extending up into Canada, we see evidence that may possibly tie to the old explorations of this region by the Norse people, the famous travels of Eric and uh, many other hardy adventurers of those days. We are interested, however, also in the fact that these legends drift a long way from the Atlantic coast. In fact, we find them in the Middle West, and particularly our Southwest. The reason for the connection with the Southwest may be, and we say this may be very definitely, the gradual moving northward of records from the Nahuatl people to the South. In other words, the Aztec influence upon our Southwest American Indian tribes. So we'll take one or two typical examples because we cannot possibly cover all of the various accounts. Some 30 years ago, I brought up here to Los Angeles one of the last of the great Navajo medicine priests, Faustine Claw. He has since passed on, but he lived with me for several months. I made a permanent record of certain of the early phases of his people's history, so far as he was able to restore this history. For he could only follow the traditional way of his people and say, this has been said, or it has been told, or this is the way our fathers knew it. There are no dates, there are no clear statements such as we might desire. But for centuries, the form of the sand paintings have been very, has been very carefully preserved. And it is, not, it is notable even today that different sand painters, apparently with no direct contact with each other, when producing the same picture or the same symbolic purpose, produce work almost identical. There seems therefore to be a very strong traditional descent. And Carl Jung makes quite a point of this when he visited that area and studied these paintings in terms of his archetypal theories on a psychological level. Faustine Kla was perhaps one of the last and most enlightened of his people. And the Museum of Ceremonial Navajo Arts in Santa Fe today 
uh, was built very largely to preserve the relics of his work, to keep in the form of permanent recordings his sacred chants and many other parallel works of interest, because it was firmly believed then and known now that this knowledge is disappearing almost entirely from the younger men. The original form of the sand painting, as you know, is made of sand uh, with uh, various colored ground stones and pigments, and it is the law and the rule that at sundown the paintings must be destroyed. It is said in the ancient times that they were drawn up in clouds by the gods, and with sunset the drawings, the clouds disappeared. Uh, through the courtesy and kindness of Hostine Kla, however, he was willing to make and did make a whole series of permanent paintings, drawing them crudely in his own way with the simple materials of a child, but nevertheless preserving for us and a truly authentic record of the designs involved in these paintings. I asked him at that time to tell me as much as he could about the beginnings of his people and where, according to the legends of the general region, his nation came from. He said that he could only give us the legends. He had an interpretation of his own, but he did not know whether it was correct or not. He suspected that perhaps some of the progenitors of his tribes had lived somewhere below the rim of the Grand Canyon, that they had chosen to live far down in this difficult region because it gave them certain protection from their enemies, and uh, they could place their little villages and communities in almost inaccessible localities. He believed, perhaps, that the legend that his people came out of the earth might have originated from some such a source. But the story is substantially this. At a time long ago, uh, but before the sun and the moon came above the earth, uh, the peoples, the Indians, his tribe, he knew no other Indians except those of the Southwest, these peoples lived under the earth. The sun, the moon, and the stars were under the earth with them. They lived in a strange subterranean region. And instead of being lighted by the kind of lights that we know, it was lighted, it was lighted by four mountains. And these four mountains were at the four cardinal corners of the world. And these four mountains produced the seasons and the times of the day and all the changes that come in the natural course of a year. These mountains mysteriously rose and sank like suns, uh, bringing with them various lights or changes of harvest and things of that nature. All his people lived there very happily, and everyone was well fed. There were no wars, there were no uh, evils, there was no sickness, and the peoples lived for a great length of time. And over these peoples there ruled seven elders, seven very good and wise chieftains, who were not just mortal men, they were, they were kind of divine people because they were built or created out of meteors and stardust and their original home was the Milky Way and they lived uh, far removed from any uh, ordinary mortal condition. These good gods and uh, the people dwelt together in happiness until crime came. And this crime consisted of the stealing away of the infant child of one of the deities. And this child was stolen for selfish and uh, uh, bad purposes. Why, how, what, no one seems to know. But anyway, the child was stolen. And as a result of that, the wrath of the gods returned against this people. And a great flood of water was sent into the underworld. And the lower parts of it first were covered with water, and then the water rose higher and higher and higher, until it threatened to drown all the peoples, because they were in this vast cave-like region, and above their heads was a dark wall of earth. And in this critical time, they observed something that was of great wonder, namely that this water uh, that was endangering their lives made the grain to grow and various types of grain, particularly a maize or corn-like grain, uh, grew very rapidly and to tremendous size, almost like the fabled uh, beanstalk of Jack in the old fairy tale. So the uh, human beings, seeking to escape the deluge that was gradually flooding their land, took refuge upon the branches of these grain stalks. 
And as the water rose, the grain stalks grew also, until finally the grain stalks reached the very under surface of the bowl of the earth above them, the surface of the earth. And here is Horstein Claus' drawing of the adventurous circumstances of his people coming up on the grain stalks. <coughs> Now here on the branches of the, bra of the grain stalks are all the little pre-Indians, the ones who were just coming out of the subterranean world. Now you will notice that some of the Indians are square-headed and some of them are round-headed. Uh, this refers to the fact that they are either male or female. The square heads being male, as might have been supposed. <laughs> Now, with these uh, creatures that uh, climbed up on the grain stalks, also came all kinds of animals and birds and everything else that had tried to escape from the underworld. Well, you could imagine that the traffic was rather heavy on the stalks, and uh, space was at a premium, and uh, it was not easy to get a reservation. So the, uh, the story is that the wild turkey managed only to get on the lowest leaf of the stalk, and he was saved as a result, but his tail feathers dangled in the waters of the deluge and the color was all washed out of them. Now such legends of, as this, of course, are very common among all Indian peoples. But here you have what might almost be termed the Navajo story of the preservation of man from the deluge. Uh, the story continues to have a happy ending. For when these grain stalks reached the inner surface of the earth, they continued to grow, and they sort of bored their way through the earth's surface. And they came out into the upper world. And all along the way, we see these little peoples coming out of the earth where the holes were made for the grain stalks. And they came up with the grain. And they came out onto the surface of the earth, and they found a strange world they'd never known before. A world in which uh, there was, at that time, no life as we know it. But they also received another surprise, for the great mountains, the four great mountains that had lighted the underworld, came up also, and uh, became the great mountains that uh, surround the general area of the Navajo reservations. One of these, of course, Flagstaff Mountain, was very sacred and especially important to them. The Katsinas, or deities, uh, mostly lived in those mountains and still live there today according to the rituals and the religious doctrines of these people. When the uh, little Indians from the underworld came up to the surface, uh, the waters seemed to subside. Some waters came up too and there were fountains out of the earth which made the land fertile and the waters from the underworld made it possible for them to create gardens and land on the surface world. The uh, mountains gave place to the birth of the sun and moon, and the deities went back into the sky again. And they uh, built campfires out of petrified wood and lit them with lightning flashes. They had really quite a dramatic story. But behind all of this was Hostin Claus' simple belief that the beginning of his people was that they came from a land somewhere below, which had been destroyed by water as a result of sin. These things put together give us a rather interesting story. Now, while Osteen was with me, I showed him a number of old books and manuscripts. And one of these books captured his fancy. And he looked at it many, many times. And he studied it very deeply. And, of course, in our way of thinking, he was entirely illiterate. He spoke no English whatsoever. Uh, he neither uh, read nor wrote actually. The only thing he could make was uh, his sand paintings, and he probably could have made certain pictographs which were common to his people, but he had no knowledge of languages as we know them. It was therefore only through the courtesy of a mutual friend, a young Indian by the name of Haskin Oswood, that we were able to uh, get a close contact with his thinking. But after looking over a number of manuscripts and old symbols, books, and things of that nature, Hostein Kla lighted up and said and pointed with his very large brown finger he pointed at the Chaldean, Babylonian and Phoenician remains and he said these our people knew about he said, I do not know what they knew I do not know how they found out 
But these different symbols and designs, according to him, he said, they touch something inside, deeper than memory. Something that goes back beyond my people. Now this is interesting, in as much as German research in the last 25 years has indicated that the typical American Indian cosmological belief is identical with that in the Valley of the Euphrates. That their same general division of the universe. Although, of course, it's hard to say the American Indian any more than it is easy to say uh, the Egyptian. Egyptian culture is divided into more than 50 major branches. The American Indians actually, actually consisted of more than 150 nations, each with his own language, with his own beliefs, with his own concepts. So to say what all of them believed would be a very great exaggeration. But it has been noted that there is a broad prevalence among these tribes, and Schoolcraft also points it out, and he is the greatest authority on the American Indians, that there are infinite numbers of parallels between uh, the beliefs of these people and the beliefs of the Assyrians, Chaldeans, and Babylonians. This goes so far as their division of the universe into the typical three parts, which we still find indicated in Christianity in the triple crown of the Pope, namely heaven, earth, and hell. The three worlds, the world that is above, the middle world in which mortals live, and a world underneath. This world underneath is where men came from and where they will ultimately return again. Everyone that is born is born out of some kind of a dark earth and returns to it again in the burial ceremonies, into the mounds or into the sacred remains. The earth is ruled over or governed from within itself by spirits. And one of these spirits, the most important perhaps, is the great earth mother. And the great earth mother, the Coatlicue of the Aztecs, uh, was supposedly the one who was reached by the serpent messengers. And in the snake ceremonies, the serpents are released to carry the messages of the tribes to the gods that live under the earth. The serpents returning to their holes in the earth are supposed to convey the message. In the ceremonial temples of the southwest Indians, there is usually a hole or well-like depression in one corner of the sanctum so that the voice or the words of the councils can go down to the earth mother and can be listened to by her great ear, which is represented by the bent in the ground. On the surface are the Indian peoples and nations scattered about. Above them, uh, high in the air, is the abode of the gods, placed in a heaven region, as in the Near East and in ancient Asia. The messenger between the earth and the gods above is in among, among the North American Indians is the Thunderbird, the symbol of the priesthood, the bird that lives in clouds, the bird whose eyes flash to cause the lightning, and the flutter of whose wings brings thunder. And also it is this bird, when in flight and soaring with its wings fluttering, causes the rain to fall. All of these messengers from the earth, therefore, are birds flying upward, carrying the soul messages to the great spirits, the elders, the wise ones, the olds of the true, who live in the great medicine lodge above the sky. All this is essentially Chaldean and uh, gives us something that perhaps is a clue to a contact between these people and other nations or other racial areas at a long remote time. This is typical, what we've said is more or less typical of a wide variety of accounts uh, relating to these matters to be found among the North American Indian peoples. Our records here are poor because of the lack of written form. Also because so much of the old legendary and lore has died out, many tribes have become extinct or completely submerged in the civilizations around them. For many years it has been practically illegal for these peoples to celebrate or preserve their own rituals and rites. Therefore by degrees these things have disappeared and the young men of today are not perpetuating them, as old Hostein Claus so tearfully told me. Yet these people had a knowledge of some kind, legends and records going far, far back. As we go south, however, into more uh, sophisticated regions, we find much more of interest in the form of records. Here, however, we are up against another uh, difficulty. 
uh, in the time of the Spanish conquest, there was absolutely no effort on the part of the conquerors to preserve or to investigate uh, the contemporary cultures which they were rapidly destroying. We cannot say that this was true in all cases, but it was true in the majority of cases. We know that the conquistador Montejo, landing in, uh, on the peninsula of Yucatan, what is now Merida, uh, not only um, massacred huge numbers of the natives, but ordered all their written records and books to be piled in the city squares and burned. Everything was done to destroy these records. Uh, further north, the effort in the Aztec Empire was also rather thoroughly carried on uh, by those who followed in the footsteps of Cortes. But of course in the northern area we have a rather different situation prevailing and it is necessary for us to pause for a moment and consider these situations and what they mean in terms of evidence relating to our principal theme. The Maya peoples have developed a highly specialized language. They had the skill to pre preserve and perpetuate practically any record of any kind which they desired or intended to perpetuate. That they were reasonably good historians and that they were careful <coughs> in their thinking. We know from certain remnants that have survived from the transition period between the old uh, Aztec and the old Inca uh, Maya uh, period and that of the later Spanish. I'm referring particularly to uh, the Chilamban uh, or the Book of the Old Men, the Chilamban of uh, Cozumel, for example, which was in Matador and mysteriously disappeared after some American archaeologists passed through town. And what happened to it, we're not saying, but the book is gone. But it was a record of the origin of their people, as best as they could preserve it. But it was incomplete due to the difficulties imposed by the conquest. In the first place, it is probable from what we can learn today that the art of writing was held in the keeping of the priests, of the elders, of those who were custodians of great knowledge. The ordinary Indian peasant, uh, the um, commoner, did not possess this knowledge so far as we can learn. Therefore, the disappearance of a priestly or governing class reduced the rest of the people to comparative illiteracy as far as the deciphering of written words and written languages would be concerned. Also, uh, almost immediately, the Spanish introduced their own characters. And we have a polyglot situation arising that is quite remarkable and has continued to this day. The Mayas of Yucatan, Guatemala, Honduras, and other areas still speak their ancient language. But they write it in Spanish letters, they cannot read their glyphs, and they haven't the slightest way of associating the ancient monumental inscriptions with the words that they are daily using. They just do not know. And groups of them visit their ancient monuments with as much curiosity as any foreign tourist. They do not have the records, or if they have the records, as has been suspected, they are certainly keeping them to themselves. They are not telling anyone. Uh, the Archbishop Landa, who was in many ways a sincere churchman, a very intolerable, intolerant ecclesiastic, but likewise scholarly, made an effort to discover or create the equivalent of a Rosetta Stone to bind the Spanish forms with the ancient Maya glyphs. He created an alphabet of 33 characters, uh, having a certain sound equivalence and certain distinct meanings. And he has left this as what is known as the Landa alphabet. Now the Landa alphabet is certainly composed of figures and symbols similar to those found in the ancient Mayan inscriptions. The only difficulty is you can't read the inscriptions with his alphabet. The uh, final point appears to be this, that Lander took certain glyphs that were phonetically similar to the Spanish word or letter sounds. These, from these he formed a phonetic alphabet, probably following in part a rule which these Indians themselves used. 
Therefore, he could write in their glyphs sounds which they could pronounce and use these sounds as a means of teaching them Spanish. Very complicated situation, uh, which perhaps gave great courage to the missionaries who are said to have been able by this means to introduce the Indians to the phonetic sounds of the Mass, but it did very little in terms of restoring the ancient writings and the ancient uh, knowledge. Perhaps the most valiant person in this entire muddle, as far as records were concerned, was Father or uh, the uh, monk, Fra Bernardino de Sahagun. This man uh, was the first, probably, Americanist. He came over with the Spanish conquerors. He came over to give his life to the service of the poor benighted heathen Indians. But he had not been here long before he suddenly realized that a tremendous culture was falling apart around him. He used his influence and finally was able to convince some of his superiors of the importance of preserving an adequate record of the life and time, the beliefs, the philosophies, and the histories of these Indians. He gathered together all the native help that he could get. He traveled throughout the Mexican area. He uh, secured copies or made copies of many of the most valuable pictographic manuscripts that have entirely disappeared. He worked heroically, and he finally compiled a great work uh, which contained most of the available information. This great work exists in three or four early manuscript copies, the most complete of which is the great Florentine Zagun, uh, kept in the bibliotheque in Florence. And uh, this has recently uh, been subject to a completely new translation by the uh, Museum of New Mexico. It has come out in several volumes, restoring the astronomy, the medicine, the science of these ancient Indians. For Sargun, then, we must have a word of great praise. But unfortunately, he was not concerned with Atlantis. He was, however, concerned with the origin of these people so far as he could trace it. And a study of his work is very valuable in helping us to orient some of these uh, mysterious uh, breaks in our tradition and legendary. The Aztec language, as a language, offers very few distinct difficulties. It is a language in a transition period, uh, moving from pictographic into the syllabic form. It is a combination of pictographs and what might be termed true hieroglyphics much as in the case of the Egyptian. These Indians, the Aztecs, had reached that platform in the development of their written form in which they had begun to compound words for various reasons and purposes and to create hieroglyphical or pictographic representations of these compounds. They did this by the creation of composite creatures whose names had very, me, various meanings. Perhaps the simplest, most dramatic, and most familiar of all examples of this is the name Quetzalcoatl. This word simply means feathered snake, and the glyph for it is a snake with feathers. Yet any Aztec seeing this combination of the feather and the serpent would not necessarily think of the feathered serpent he would think of the two words, Quetzal and Coapel, and therefore be in a position to pronounce the name that this represented. They had done this by the gradual developing of compounds. They would take the head of a deer and place it on the, the body, we will say, of, of some other animal, such as a dog. This was then to be pronounced as a new word combination giving the possibility of naming places or naming persons and the possibility of placing over the head of an individual the glyph which would be pronounced as his name, a glyph composed of two or three other objects grouped together in an arrangement which would indicate which part was pronounced first, then the center and the final, or the beginning and end of the name. This shows the general degree which they had reached in the development of language. 
For the rest of the picture, their uh, written forms are picture writing of a somewhat more sophisticated nature, however, than that of our North American Indians. The Mayas, on the other hand, had passed entirely beyond the picture writing stage. They had moved into the true pattern of glyphs, and they therefore reached the point in which they illustrated manuscripts. They used the glyphs for the text and put pictures in just as we do. One of the hopes that we have of ultimately solving their language is the relationship between the glyphic description and the picture representing it. We hope that this may ultimately prove to be the Rosetta Stone. Dr. Gates of John Hopkins has done the most, perhaps, in the effort to decode the Meyer glyphs. He is the authority for the statement that in comparison to any other existing language, the nearest parallel he has been able to find to the Maya writing is the Chinese. He does not, however, say that it is his firm belief that this writing originated in China. But he is inclined to think that a psychology of some kind, the type of psychological approach which affected the Chinese mind in the development of its written form, also affected whatever was the attitude behind the gradual rise and development of the Maya language. We have today, through the work of many men, one of whom, perhaps Mr. Willard, is quite well known, who lived for some years, part of the time at Chichen Itza, and helped Thompson in the dredging of the sacred well. Uh, Willard and several others worked upon the glyphs using the various dictionaries of the Maya language which are available, trying to bridge back and forth, back and forth, between some word and the glyphic symbol of it, trying to pick out of the written forms the glyphs that would correspond with certain plants, certain animals, certain seasons of the year, working back and forth to try to create a means of writing in the glyph form or reading the ancient glyph structure. Through Spindon and Morley, we have been able to restore the Aztec numeration system and also the Maya. We know how they calculated time. We know the monumental and manuscript glyphs for the various great cycles. We also know their simple numerational system in which the dash or line represented five and the dot represented one. Therefore, two lines, two horizontal lines with two dots under them, represented the number 12. This we also are able to restore from the tonal model or the calendar system. Actually, therefore, we have very little knowledge of the ancient languages. And the question is as to whether we have any true key to the Atlantic language, to the language of the Atlantean people. We have no true key. I have seen in the last 35 or 40 years probably 50 examples of alleged Atlantean writing. Some of this resulting from psychic revelation, some of it from old and undeciphered inscriptions in remote places, uh, some speculative reconstructions based upon other languages, and a certain effort to arrive at what might be termed a mother language by combining all known forms. This, however, has had somewhat the reverse action of Esperanto. It has become a kind of polyglot, which gives us no official security in believing that we have actually found their language. If we wish to assume that perhaps either in Egypt or among the Central American peoples, we have a comparatively complete descent of the old writings, then it is possible that the Atlantean had a language somewhat similar or paralleling the Chinese or the Mayan or Egyptian glyphic forms. These were a highly specialized, highly flexible type of writing, not cramped as we would have think by pictorial limitation, but susceptible by certain markings of being transformed at any point into phonetics uh, so that names, dates, and places could be inserted easily, and by certain rules, uh, a symbol could either be a letter, a word, or an incident or circumstance which corresponded with it. The great trouble has been to differentiate between the various usages, because we have no knowledge of their grammar, or essentially of their punctuational system, or any way of dividing and arranging their forms. 
We know that the maya, for instance, created a verb out of a noun by adding a wing, giving the sense of motion or vitality to it. We know that the Aztecs usually represented motion with footprints, moving, directions of things, or the flights of arrows, the flights of birds, or anything that signified motion. We know also, for example, that the Aztecs used the arrow to symbolize an enemy. They also used it to symbolize a course of action, a motion. They used it to symbolize conquest. And when an arrow was, or a lockle, a javelin, was cast into the side of a, of a symbol representing a mountain, it meant the capture of a city. All of these things tell us something, but they do not tell us too much. I have heard Mayan spoken, and it is a very beautiful and very musical language. A language which shows tremendous inflection and very subtle uh, charm in all of the parts of it. The Mayan music is also a highly evolved and technical development within the structure of music. But we have very little information to aid us or direct us in our search for the origin of these people. In the uh, great period of time which followed Fra Bernardino de Sagun, very little was done until the 19th century, in which in the early part, focus was uh, drawn or attention was drawn to this area by the Abbe Brazier de Bourbourg, a French archaeologist, who perhaps was one of the first to move into the field with a strange transcendental background that you would not particularly associate with his theological structure. But he was the one who perhaps first and foremost pointed to the Maya people and the Central American civilization as Atlantean. He was, uh, I think, perhaps the first to uh, dare to make so strong a pronouncement. And his pronouncement was backed with considerable scientific research he was heavily criticized, as might be expected, and uh, he did work under great limitation for the reason that everyone has worked under a certain heavy, darkening cloud, the impossibility of restoring what the old Spaniards had destroyed, had left practically every thread broken, every connection shattered and in addition to this had created such intimidation among the people that they had almost locked their own souls against any remembrance of what they themselves knew. There was a tremendous complex, a tremendous neurosis sent a, sent a, descended upon these natives and they became practically inarticulate. Following in the footsteps of de Bourbourg and tremendously influenced by his thinking, uh, came uh, the French scientist, photographer, archaeologist, Freemasonic scholar, and general map maker uh, of parts, uh, Professor or Dr. Augustus Le Plongeon. Uh, Le Plongeon has left uh, two fairly important books dealing with the field. One is Queen Mu and the Egyptian Sphinx, and the other is Sacred Mysteries Among the Mayas and Kichis. Le Plongeon great black beard, was a man of extraordinary personality and a strong devotee of the Atlantis concept. In fact, he tried in every way possible to popularize it. Laplongian has had the distinction of being the first man to go into the Central American area with a camera. Therefore, his photographs, made on the spot with wet plate negatives and developed at night in the dark temple recesses of the old buildings, are the first photographic records that we have, and they are very valuable because many of the ruins which he investigated um, probably 70 years ago, 75 years ago, are now uh, no longer even in the state in which he found them. There's been progressive deterioration. Up in the uh, Valley of Mexico, for example, the pyramids of Xochicalco uh, has, this pyramid has been partly destroyed uh, by the man owning the land on which it stood in order that he could build stables with the rocks. Uh, everything has gone from bad to worse in that area and has, has seriously crippled all research. Laplongeon was a dreamer, was an idealist. 
He went into the field in which nothing had been done. He made a great many mistakes, and these have been held against him, perhaps more than they should be, because he had no one to fall back on, no one to act as authority, no previous work upon which he could build. He went in with the machete and cut the jungle himself. That he should not have discovered things that were not found for fifty years later, we cannot blame him. But he did go in with two tremendous assets. One was a knowledge of the language. Le Plongeon was one of the few Americanists who has ever known the Maya language. He could speak it and speak it well. He also went in with a tremendous basic sympathy for the people. He went in because he loved them, because he wanted to do something important with them and for them. He was quite a contagious person, apparently, in these respects, and the natives became so fascinated with him uh, that they really made him a blood brother. He probably was able to get more out of the reticent Mayan than any other man before him or since. These points must be borne in mind in evaluating his findings. That certain of his archaeological uh, conclusions may have been incorrect, we know. He claimed to have been able to read the Codex Troano, one of the great Mexican, sac uh, one of the great Maya sacred books. And he also claimed uh, that this work contained a record of the Atlantean deluge. He also held that the Aztecs had a similar record, and that the pyramid of Xochicalco, previously mentioned, had upon it a complete statement of these ancient records concerning the destruction of Atlantis and was a monument created to commemorate the survivors of this catastrophe. Now, no one can prove or disprove Le Plongeon. He claimed to have read the glyphs. I have seen his notebooks in which day by day he and his wife pored over these inscriptions and carefully decoded them one by one. One of his principal keys in decoding was the Egyptian glyphs, because he had already observed and learned that hundreds of Mayan words are almost identical in pronunciation and in meaning with Egyptian words of the ancient dynastic period. He also, however, suspected and mentioned the possibility that this language had a tie with Asia. And he, he thinks a little also, uh, like some of the other men, of the possibility of the Chinese being involved. As he preceded Gates, perhaps Gates is indebted to him for this phase of his own conclusions. The Plongeon remained a number of years in the area. He discovered a number of archaeological items of interest and importance. He had a bitter feud with the Mexican government and finally came home a broken-hearted man. He was never able to achieve his end, namely to open Central America to archaeology. But later, other men following in his footsteps achieved most of the end which he had att attempted, but he did not live to see or know that this had occurred. Le Plongeon, then, is a strong link with the Atlantis theory in the Western world. He, is de he derives much of his encouragement and thinking from the Abbe Brizard de Bourbourg, followed very closely in much of his thinking, and attempted to reconstruct as much as he could from de Bourbourg's descriptions of certain important things, like the, uh, the great Temple of the Cross at Palenque, which appears to have a very early Christian tie. I might also mention that about the year 1835, uh, Lord Kingsborough, an English nobleman, became so tremendously impressed by the findings of the ancient codices and monuments and uh, records, including the researches of Dupay, that he financed at his own expense a great work called The Antiquities of Mexico, which is bound variously in from seven to nine volumes of elephant folio, tremendous books, these containing facsimiles of all known manuscripts and a faithful Spanish translation, but not into English, of the, the Sahagun, or the Dresden Codex of Fra uh, Bernardino de Sahagun. Lord Kingsborough, himself quite a speculating thinker, who incidentally uh, became hopelessly impoverished and bankrupt at the cost of the tremendous work he was doing, also believed that there was a distinct connection between 
the Maya Aztec complex and the valley of the Euphrates. He comes in on this angle, and he believes that one of the apostles, perhaps Thomas, reached the Western Hemisphere as early as the first century. He gives a whole group of analogies, rituals, rites, and ceremonies tying the religious doctrines taught by Quetzalcoatl with the ancient teachings of the Babylonians and Chaldeans. Kingsborough also in passing tosses a thought towards Asia and also becomes a little wondering over the possible Chinese contribution. Kingsborough's works are of, the, of continual and pressing interest to us. They comprise today the largest available collection of the great Aztec Maya manuscripts to be found in the museums of Europe. Uh, the Aztec manuscript group, called Codices, is not particularly limited. Probably two or three hundred or more, perhaps, are known to exist. The Maya group is extremely rare, however. And up to the present time, only three works are known to exist. We have one here in our library, which we hope will prove to be the fourth original to exist. Uh, Dr. Morley, who is the, was the greatest expert on the subject, passed very favorably on our manuscript. But these manuscripts are extremely rare. They, uh, compromise, they uh, make up the only surviving literature of a great people that had libraries and everything of that nature. There is always, however, in remembering the Dead Sea Scrolls episode, there is always the possibility that more will be found. It was on these codices that attention concerning Atlantis gradually came to be centered by the Bourbourg, Le Plongeon, and Louis Spence of the British Museum. These men were all working on this particular theme, and they um, gave a considerable amount of literary space to it in the course of their lives. This also involved to a degree the thinkings of Ignatius Donnelly, who had already pointed in the direction of this Maya complex as a possible place for the solution of the Atlantic mystery. Uh, we told you before that there are certain remnants or relics relating to this subject that seem to have some importance for us. And I wanted to show you two of the highly controversial items, because perhaps uh, they will be of value. Uh, the homeland, or the place from which uh, the Nahuatl people, the people of the Valley of Mexico, this would be in the Aztec area, trace their descent is a mysterious spot which they call Aziland, or Atziland. Now, in their language, this word does have certain suggestion of the term Atlantis, Azuland. They believe that they came from there, and here is one of the manuscripts, uh, codices, in the Museum of Archaeology in Mexico City. This is the story of the wanderings of the Aztecs. That is, literal translation. A pre-Columbian pictograph work, translated from the original, which is in the Museum National of Mexico. This document, accurately colored to facilitate interpretation, and the edition limited to 25 numbered and signed examples. This is the official type of facsimile that is being issued by the Mexican peoples in order to facilitate the study of their ancient writings. Now, as it is said, this consists of what they call the wanderings of the peoples of the Valley of Mexico. No date, naturally and obviously, although the introduction of calendar elements might, under certain careful research, and the comparison with the existing Tornalemotl, particularly the Orvin, might ultimately result in the possibility of dating it. Uh, I don't mean dating the manuscript. The manuscript itself is pre-Columbian, uh, probably done 100, 200 years at most before the Spanish conquest. But dating the wanderings from the internal astronomical and calendar markings upon the manuscript. 
Now this is, I think, one of the most interesting because this is the beginning of the wanderings of the people of Mexico from the Codex or Manuscript of the Peregrinations or of the Wanderings. You will observe here that at the beginning of their existence we have to use their own method of writing. Here is a man in a boat who is to be the progenitor of the people. This is the beginning. You will find the footprints follow along all the way through the manuscript to the end showing the wanderings of these people. Whenever they come to some place or something of that nature where they stop or perform some action we find the symbols of the place and of what they did. And in between are the periods of the calendar in which they remained in that location. This is the part which from parallel with the Aubin may possibly ultimately break the dating which they at least assigned to the original events. But here we have the beginning. We have a body of water. How large this body of water is we will never know from the, from the glyphs because uh, it is the same way with the Indian. Uh, a, a body of water may be a mill pond or an ocean. He has no way of differentiating between them. But he does tell us that his beginnings came from an island in that body of water. Because here is a very interesting island located in the midst of a lake or some other area of water. Incidentally, on this island is a great temple and six smaller temples. In other words, he is telling us, for instance, in his own language, if he wished to read this as an Aztec, he could say this was the island of the seven houses or the seven places. Also, if you notice that on the top of this temple, which is created much like an altar, there are water symbols, symbols of springs or waters, or symbol of fertility, of, of goodness, of abundance, of uh, the thing that the Indian always needed, and that was food, and uh, things that were necessary to him. There is one large central building or altar with six smaller buildings around it. These are always building symbols. Symbol of houses. Sometimes they'll put a man sitting on the front steps of his own house and that is more or less home. That is his domicile unless he is a, a great man, then it is his palace. Below this symbolism is a representation of two human figures, one male and the other female. So here we have the Indian telling us that his progenitors, the father and mother, were on an island, the island of the seven houses or the seven temples in the midst of a sea. Now by seven temples, you see where you deal with pictograph, pictographs, you have certain problems you have to face. You have to be a little more liberal than you would be with a more accurate form of language. Those house signs, as we say, are symbols of many things. In the native village in old times, only the temple or the palace was of permanent materials. The natives themselves lived in huts, which were easily destructible. Therefore, a stone building represents a capital. It represents a center of government, a palace, perhaps uh, some important building. And by extension, it can represent the capital of a nation. Remember that Montezuma, who belonged to this culture group, and therefore should have quoted from it, or should have understood it, in speaking to Cortez, said that he knew that his ancestors came from seven islands. Now these seven buildings could represent, therefore, empires or anything of a basic septenary nature relating to leadership, government, origin, cities, races, clans, groups, culture groups. Now to get from where he was to his next destination, it was necessary for him, therefore, to cross water. Therefore he is rowing away from this land, he steps out upon the shore and he takes three steps. 
The amount, the amount, the footprints, however, do not necessarily indicate, as far as we know, any prescribed number of steps. It's simply that he traveled in that particular direction. This occurred at the time of one obsidian knife. Now, of course, that clears everything. <laughs> we have a date. This occurred in the date of one flint knife, which, incidentally, was one of their day signs or one of their astronomical symbols uh, for the divisions of their month. Therefore, all this occurred in one, which is a beginning of something. It's the beginning of some calendar cycle. And it was in the beginning of the month or the day of the obsidian knife, which was later the sacrificial knife, and which also became later a deity, one of their most ancient gods being the obsidian knife, which was sometimes represented with human arms and, and had a very great importance for them. Now they went on a little time along the road here and they came to a place. This is a place. Uh, now this is uh, not the kind of a place that one of these little houses is. This is a place in the sense that it is the area or land or tribal domain of a people using a conventionalized form of the mountain symbol. This is an area. This is the land of somebody. We find in the Bible reference made to the traveler who came to the land of Canaan. This would be a land, a place, represented by a mountain. Now the name of this place we cannot completely restore, but we can give a certain amount of meaning to it. For this was the abode of the eagle man. This was the land of the eagle man. And if you remember in your Mexican history, the eagle man is still one of their most common symbols, a human face coming out of an eagle's mouth. This is represented here. Above this rises the sign of communication, of counsel, of discussion and of, of certain treaties, pacifications, and various activities represented by these peculiar smoke signals or signs which rise out of this. And here we also find that they didn't stop, but they went on past this. And then we find the alignment of these peoples. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We find eight peoples now forming the next act in this drama. We find them with their symbols of their nations and tribes, represented by the glyphs by which their names can be read, and that each one of them spoke, for words come out of his mouth, symbols of breath and air. And then they start out and four of them travel. And these four are represented by their names up above telling who they are and what they are. And this man, this particular person here, was the water or cloud of heaven. This seemingly represented a sieve, the name of the, of the little uh, basket sieve used to sift grain. And these were serpent symbols. These were the persons who traveled. This particular person carried an infant. Now they started out, and they went through all the adventures which came in the creation of their journey and their final establishment in the Valley of Mexico. The point that interests us, we can't go, begin to go through the whole story. It would be rather meaningless after a certain point because it settles into wars and griefs and troubles. But here, is one of the earliest and most traditional forms of the origin of these people. That they came from a land or an island that is gone. That on this island there were seven temples or seven sacred places. This was where their Adam and Eve was, uh, were, uh, came, were placed, where they just came from. And here they traveled by boat to another land and began to move across that land. Where they moved and how they moved, we cannot know unless we could find out the point where they struck land. If we knew the landfall of this expedition, we would know what to do next, but we do not know. 
We do not know what they meant by this community. We do not know where it is. We know that in the time or the day of the one flint knife that they made this particular journey and started out on this travel, coming by water from somewhere. Now these particular glyphs, and there are more similar picture manuscripts, some even resembling more closely islands than this does. These have all led uh, to considerable comfort to those who feel that this people definitely did come as they themselves believed they came from some island or continent now submerged and lost. Now we want to pause again and take up the problem of the people that we call the Mayas further south because we're going to have to also visit them again. But for that purpose let us realize that the word Maya simply means greetings. How are you? And when the Spaniards first arrived in the area, uh, the Indians met them and, uh, bowing very low, said Maya. From that time on, they were Mayans. Actually, the, the name has no uh, actual or real significance in the ethnology of this group of people. The real name of these people, as far as we know, is the Itzas. And the uh, Itza gained his name or his distinction because he was the child of Itzamna. And Itzamna is the radiant being seated in the golden egg of heaven adorned with the plumes of the bird of paradise. He is the mysterious father of the peoples, referred to sometimes as the ancient one with the crooked tooth. Uh, according to the early legends, Itzamna was a patriarch, a very great and wonderful man, and uh, there was a great catastrophe far away, across the great water. And Itzamna took a remnant of that people and put them in boats, and he navigated with them, and he carried them, or he guided them across the water, presumably pausing somewhere in the West Indies and then continuing on to the coast of Mexico or Central America. Where Zamna originally landed, we do not know. There are several contenders for the distinction of having solved this riddle, but the, uh, the riddle is not actually solved. Some believe that it was probably in the area of Palenque in southern Mexico. Others believe that it was more likely still further south, either in the peninsula of Yucatan or even south of that. But anyway, he came across from somewhere and was called the father of the Ixas. He was their great god, for he had rescued them from the dangers of Hunabku, the god of waters. And he had saved them and preserved them from the deluge. And in some of their old temples, there are actual carvings representing this. Carvings which go so far as to show the land from which he came crumbling into the sea as the result of seismic cataclysms of some kind. People are drowning in the water around the boats, but Zamna and his chosen people were carried safely across the great deluge and came finally to the shores of the Western Hemisphere. We have no way of dating this, except uh, the possible speculation. We do not have any record in the Western Hemisphere of the older and opening cycles of the Maya calendar. It begins in the seventh cycle on the Western Hemisphere, so far as we know, even in the old empire. Therefore, the other six cycles may relate to the experiences of these peoples in some other region. The attitude that these are, were purely mythological cycles, as advanced by Spindon, I do not think is a justifiable one. We mention the fact that of the ancient Maya writings, only three are known to exist today that are uh, in common agreement that experts agree are absolutely genuine. Uh, these are the Codex Dresden, 
which is in Dresden at the present time. The second is the Codex Pires, very fragmentary, which is in the Bibliothèque Nationale in France. And the other is now in two sections, but they were originally one book, called the Troano and the Cortesiano, or more correctly, the Tro Cortesiano, which is in Madrid. These represent our knowledge of the ancient literature of the Maya people. In the same unusual service for the Mexican Bureau of Archaeology and Ethnology, this, uh, these manuscripts have also been reproduced in Mexico, uh, and um, in this particular case also 25 copies were made. The manuscript of the Picture Ritual of the Maya, conserved in the Library of Dresden in Germany. Uh, this particular copy, these copies were made in 1947. Uh, this shows you almost instantly, in comparison to the last one, the difference on the, in the culture platform and the written forms of these people. Here you have manuscripts in a comparatively high degree of written form. You're no longer dealing merely with pictographic and pictographic representations. You are dealing with illustrated manuscripts, as we have noted, the panels representing certain deities, the intervening sections representing dates, times, historical incidents, and ritualistic material. Most of these uh, manuscripts belong to a class that is known as the Tornalamato, which simply means calendar. They were books relating to the motions of the heavens, sacred days, the ceremonies of the various gods, and other attendant religious details. But apparently a number of them did drift along into history, and like your Chinese almanac, which is a good uh, parallel for it, uh, included fragments of information on all useful and useless subjects that came to mind at the moment. This, uh, however, is interesting to us primarily because uh, leaf uh, 74 of the uh, manuscript Dresden, that is the leaf here, the dark leaf with the elaborate illustration, is the leaf hit upon by both de Bourbourg and Laplongeon and substantiated very strongly by Louis Spence of the British Museum and other modern Americanists as being the representation of the deluge. This is the, believed to be the Meyer glyphic representation of the sinking of Atlantis. Now, perhaps you may have a little difficulty in recognizing it right off. Uh, but uh, I will try to be a little bit helpful. Uh, Laplongeon claimed that he had been able to decode this panel of text and these those characters here. But apart entirely from the decoding, uh, we have certain indications. Here is the sky dragon, or sky serpent, the same one that appears on the calendar stone in Mexico. This is the great Coatl, the serpent. On the back, in the form of the scales, are constellational symbols used to represent star groups, planets, and sidereal phenomena. They are trying to tell us here that something happened under this combination of planets, or, or signs of the heavens. And they have inscribed it, as the Aztecs did later, upon the coils of the serpent of heaven. You will notice that out of the mouth of the great serpent there pours a stream of water. This is the Maya water symbol. A great stream of water is pouring out. In other words, the sky or heavens have opened and dumped a deluge or a mass of water. Great storm would be the least you could say for it. Now, in addition to being a great storm in this case, we have a strange figure here. You see, this storm of water is coming not only from the mouth of the dragon or serpent, but also coming from certain of the constellational symbols on its body. There's a great flowing downward. This blue with dots in it is water. Here also we find a strange person that uh, Laplongeon and others believe represented 
the earth mother. And she also has a bucket or bowl of water overturned, which is continually pouring more water. In other words, it, the water is flowing from everywhere, downward onto this, into this sea. Below is another figure, the god of death. He is arrayed in his proper and typical form, and he is dancing upon the earth. He carries in his hand the great ceremonial atlatls and the throwing stick, the sign similar to the thunderbolts of Zeus in meaning, the symbols of his weapons and adornment. He is painted black to symbolize death. Therefore the heavens open, the earth mother's fountains have been loosened, and death dances upon the earth. And uh, in comparison to their usual use of symbolism, this heroic representation, because they have many lesser symbols of storms and things of that nature, and coming as it does at the close of a cycle, as represented by the manuscript, nearly all persons interested in the Atlantic theory have come to the conclusion that this was their effort to represent the universal deluge. And that from this point on, you have an entirely new way of life represented in the adventures and migrations of these people. Now actually no one knows with certainty whether this manuscript should be read in this way with this as the end or whether it should read from this end which of course incidentally this title page is not part of the manuscript that is the editor's edition. It begins here. Now if by any chance this manuscript should be read by the Chinese method then you would begin at the back rather than the front. And then you would have the whole story unfolding after the deluge, whatever it may be. So if it is according to the old Eastern way of writing, then the manuscript would read on from this point, perhaps tying again with the idea of the beginning of the calendar system on the other little manuscript, which began with the one flint knife. This might well be to say that an ancient world passed away, and now we begin the chronicle of those who survived and what they did. We find representations of Itzamna in these manuscripts, as the father of his people, and as the one who preserved his nations from uh, the destruction at the time of the Atlantic catastrophe. Now, further research into this problem takes us into another a related area. And that related area is the the Kichi culture, which is a stem of the Maya and lies between the Maya and the Aztec culture geographically in the uh, Mexican region. The Kichis worship the deity Quetzalcoatl in the form of Gucumas, another term for the feathered serpent. And they had a mystery or a ritual which they celebrated and which has been uh, preserved for us in a rather imperfect but perhaps significant copy. This copy is regarded as imperfect because it was undoubtedly compiled after the introduction of Christianity into the area. Therefore, to what degree it represents a mixture of old beliefs and new beliefs, we do not actually know. And we must, therefore, be a little conservative, for the person who wrote the manuscript to which we refer could have had access to the Genesis account in the Bible. Thus, we are not sure what our ground is in this particular case. The work uh, to which we refer is the Popol Vuh, which is the sacred book of the Kichi, a very good edition having been uh, prepared and published uh, by Dr. Morley shortly before his death. In fact, I think part of the publication work was finished after his death. He did a great deal with this, for it contained the initiation ritual of a religion which may well be a key or clue to the spiritual convictions of the peoples of the Western Hemisphere prior to the advent of the Spanish. But as we say, there is a reservation here due to the dating of the only available copies of the manuscript itself. But in this, there is certainly Indian traditional involvement. And in this involvement, we have one interesting thing. 
which is apparently authentic because it is perfectly consistent with practice all over the world. We know in the great Midi Lodge of the Ojibwe Indians, the candidate into initiation into the sacred rites is forced to walk, remember the footprints, he is forced to wander to make a certain peregrination through the symbolic recapitulation of the life of his people. He must, in other words, relive symbolically the story of his race in the process of attaining membership in the tribe. The story of the Popol Vuh carries with it the adventures of these young men seeking to be initiated into the rites of Shapalba in a temple hidden far in the jungle, a temple which when reached had its important rooms and crypts under the ground so that the candidates had to return into the serpent's hole or go back under the earth with perhaps again reference to the Navajos having come out from there and believing it was their homeland and going back again. On their way into the mysteries, however, at the rites of Shabalba, the candidate was forced to swim across two rivers, a river of blood and a river of mud. Now, this could have a great deal of significance. By the river of blood, would be certainly implied uh, the, the blood record, the blood tradition, the blood background of his people, and by the river of blood also war. And to these people, because the Mayas were themselves a peace-loving people, the introduction of a river of blood at the beginning of their life must certainly have had reference to war, to disaster, to catastrophe of some kind with a great blood shedding, a great evil. To them, blood was a symbol of evil. To also to swim across a river of thin mud or watery mud might well be a recapitulation of their trip from another land across water to reach their present abode. In other words, before he, the young man could enter the ancient sanctuary, he had to journey across blood and water. Now we have sacraments of blood and water. We have the Eucharist, which can and perhaps does have a totally different significance. But does it? Is it any? Is there a possibility that Eucharistic rites, as we know they were practiced in pre-Christian times and by non-Christian peoples, also have something to do with gratitude for salvation from death and destruction? We have these rituals among the most primitive aboriginal peoples. Therefore, it is possible that they relate back uh, to the effort to preserve a record. In the Inca culture, much further south, in Peru, we come upon an entirely different situation. The Incas were not a people. They were a race of, or order of rulers. They were a hierarchy that imposed themselves upon a pre-Inca people that existed in the highlands of the Andes long before the rise of the Inca dynasty. For the Incas themselves, we have a very reasonable story. We know that they probably came from Asia, that perhaps they brought with them uh, a fairly ex extensive knowledge of organization and government and things of that nature. And as we have, I think, mentioned on other occasions, the Japanese have a tradition that this dynasty was founded by uh, Japanese who had been driven off their courses by storms and had never been able to return home. Uh, this is quite possible and uh, perhaps explains why the Japanese government presented a statue of the first emperor of the Incas, Mango Capac, to the Peruvian government stating that this man was Japanese. In any event, the Inca culture does not present any unusual problems. It flourished for a comparatively short time. It was a highly advanced culture 
and it was completely disrupted and destroyed by internal dissension even before the arrival of Pizarro. Therefore, the Spaniards uh, gave the last blow to it, but it was in a dying state even then. Prior to this, however, there was a very ancient people in that region, a people of great attainment, a very old religious background. These people, uh, the pre-Incas, also claim that at one time, long before, they had possessed a written language. Now this is interesting because whatever happened in connection with uh, Mango Capac, even though he came comparatively late, he did not bring a written language. These people claim to have had one. And their ancient records say that this language was lost thousands of years ago. <coughs> lost so far back that there were not even any inscriptions of it that survived. But it is interesting that an illiterate people should have the boasted memory of literacy and have it before they had any idea that it meant anything, was important, or even existed. You take a typical and complete savage who has had no contact with civilization. He not only has no written language, but he cannot conceive of the existence of one. It has no meaning for him. But here is a people that before the coming of the Incas were weeping for the loss of their written language. The countless records of this will be found among their early documents. Out of what was ever was left of this, there came the pre-Inca means of communication in Peru. And this was by means of what are called the keepers. Now the keepers are fringes of knotted cords. And the knots on the cords form a kind of code. And those who are acquainted with certain combinations of knots can read them. And in this way messages can be sent back and forth. The memory, apparently, is like the Chinese, completely arbitrary. There is no alphabet behind it. There is no organization of how these knots should be tied. But certain patterns of them are known to stand for certain things. And as a result of that, there was this method of communication. Out of the same darkness and elderness of things, these pre-Incas in South America also had great and important legends. They should be included among those who believe that at the dawn of time the gods walked with men. They had hero myths and hero legends that went way back to the time when they had writing. And they declared that at a long remote time gone, they were a great, flourishing, advanced, civilized people. And yet when the Incas arrived, these were little better than Aborigines. But they were strangely proud Aborigines, strangely aware of their rights and privileges. Now the Incas did extend their power pretty thoroughly throughout the Peruvian region. But in the higher fastnesses of the Andes, uh, the so-called tribal life of the pre-Inca not only survived the rather brief dynasty of Inca rulers, but also survived the Spaniards. The reason for the survival of the Spaniards, by the, uh, surviving the Spaniards, was the Spanish never got there. And the, uh, the trails were too distant. The Spaniards tried to get into the area looking for the so-called lost treasures of the Incas. In some cases, the report is circulated about these Incas having taken their gold and their treasures into mountains and there to have caused the whole mountain to fall over the entrance of the cave, bearing not only the treasures but the last rulers of the Incas themselves. All kinds of legends abound. But although the Spaniards did their best, they never found the treasures and they never got into the distant and remote parts of the empire. Incidentally also, the empire of the Incas was a highly uh, useful, a highly moral culture. And even the dynasty of the Incas, which was the later part of this culture, was highly advanced. So much so, in, in, in fact, 
that when Pizarro asked the Inca what they did with criminals in Peru, the Inca said he did not know because they never had any, which was a little embarrassing to the Spaniards. The Incas did not believe in war. They converted their enemies instead of killing them. Uh, they took uh, undesirable citizens, put them in outlying districts, gave them farms, and helped them to rehabilitate themselves. Uh, they believed that crime was sickness and that the man should be made well rather than punished. And they taught that even before the coming of the Incas. Also we find that far behind this entire pattern is what might be termed by us the highly communized life of the Inca villages, the communal existence which these people still practice. They still have extraordinary functioning democracy. The highest democracy in the Western world was that of the Incas. They also had a highly developed uh, code for the protection of all classes of their peoples. They were almost without crime. Their religions were brilliant and liberal and tolerant. Uh, they uh, did not oppress their peoples but like the Mayas, lived for the most part in a highly noble condition. In fact, uh, it has been observed by Stuart Chase that in the first five centuries of the Christian era, the peoples of the Western Hemisphere were without doubt the most highly civilized persons on earth. Also, that they held in the Western Hemisphere the world's record for peace, 500 years without war a record the Eastern Hemisphere in Europe never attained. So these people also show from their beginnings that they participated in a high concept of government. The Maya shared in this. The Aztecs, who were a younger and more warlike people, were beginning to grow into the maturity of their contact with the Maya world to the south of them. The Aztec was moving forward rapidly, but he was certainly a younger and more aggressive culture without as, nearly as much psychic growth, as much maturity emotionally and mentally as the tribes further south. But in any event, at the time of the arrival of the Spaniards, uh, the Maya Empire was without question a model of a kind of government which has a great, has great interest to us. It is interesting for us to speculate upon the possibility that this land which we hold so sacredly as a democratic commonwealth may well have been the seat of the first functioning democracy in the history of the world. The democracy may in some way be strangely bound to this hemisphere in its experience, in its psychic way of life. We find the tremendous sense of de democratic integrity even among the wild plains Indians of our northern America. We find it more and more developing as we go further south. We find the voice of the people. We find representation, good laws, good rules, and practical absence of the exploitation and bondage of peoples that we find in other parts of the world. We find wonderful rules and laws governing behavior and conduct and protecting people and protecting their rights and protecting them even from their rulers at a time when Europe had no such rules of any kind. Now it is quite possible that these rules, these laws, these political theories, which are so in advance of that known in Europe, but were preserved from time immemorial, said to have been brought to this western land by the great teachers that came from the sea, like Quetzalcoatl, that this might have had something to do with the nature of the political structure of the old Atlantean Empire. It is quite possible that this empire, like the one in Peru and the Maya Empire, and in a small and less adequate way, the Aztec Empire, that all of these were empire democracies, like the empire democracy of Venice, that they did have monarchical leadership, but that, as in the case of Mexico, their ruler, their royalty was not hereditary. The individual was elected for life, but he was not born into to office. Every step of the way was under very 
definite uh, rights of the people to have a say in the government of their land. Perhaps there is nothing more interesting also in the entire concept that we find in the Western group than this concept of the bundling up of years, something with which they apparently had come again into contact with Chinese ideas, for the root of the idea at least can be traceable in China. And that is that every so many years, various times, usually about 50 to 56 years, often 52 years, that at, in these periods, which constituted the time of the reconciliation of the Sun-Venus calendar, that these peoples created a jubilee. Kingsborough points this up as a possible tie with the Near East. At this time, a series of rituals took place. And of course, this immediate success of Cortez was due to the fact that he arrived on the Western Hemisphere, in the Western Hemisphere on the exact date of this 52-year cycle. Therefore, this was regarded as a peculiar and sacred omen. But in this cycle, we have a series of very interesting points. First, it was their way of breaking up all pattern of debt. Also, their way of permitting accumulation uh, to be so reintegrated or reorganized that it would be impossible for a situation to build up that would go on indefinitely and finally sink an economic system. They had these stop gaps on their policies. For instance, at the time of this, of this cycle, all persons had to forgive debt. That was a sacred duty, because this cycle was sacred to the memory of their deity Quetzalcoatl, to whom they were all dedicated. And it was his wish, left ages before, that every so many years, all debt within the state should be wiped out, so that it could never pyramid, so that debt could never descend from generation to generation. Also, at that time, all reasonable bills, all normal bills, had to be paid. A man could not voluntarily owe anything. But if by circumstances it was impossible for him to pay, or if he was dead and his children would have to carry the burden, or the widow in pain would no longer have a livelihood, these were all wiped out. But as a sign of his own integrity, each man voluntarily tried to meet this day with clean hands. The second thing that he had to do was to forgive all enemies. He could carry no animosity or enmity, private or political, past the sacred day. If there was any person he had not spoken to or against whom he held a grudge, he must solve it. And the person against whom he held the animosity or who held animosity against him must forgive him. Not to do this was a sacred crime, punishable by mortal punishment. In other words, it was a crime against God, punishable by man. And any person who could prove that his enemy had not forgiven him could take his enemy to court and cause this enemy to be heavily penalized. And if the enemy flatly refused to forgive the crime, or forgive the affront or injury, whatever it might be, real or imaginary, he could be executed. No grudge could live through that day because this was the day of the God. And it was believed by these people that on one of these sacred days, Quetzalcoatl would return. And the day he came back, he must come back to a land in which there was nothing but peace and virtue, because that was what he had left. And that is what the ancient ones, the forefathers of the present tribes, had promised would be the way it was when he came back. Therefore he came back not to cleanse the sinner, but to come back to a world in which the sinners had cleansed themselves in his name. A very interesting and I think a very powerful thought. He did not come back to require forgiveness. He came back because forgiveness had been attained. These things were right. Then, like the ancient peoples of other nations, 
all fires were extinguished because it was necessary that a new light should, should be given to the world. And with the dawn of the first day of the new cycle, with the rising of the sun, the promise of the continuance of the world was celebrated. For it was assumed as a sacred fact that it would continue through the next bundle of the years. Therefore the new light was lit, the new clothing was put on, the new painting was done to the house, everything was made new and clean. Every person had to be immaculate in cleanliness. No action that was unclean could be performed. This was a period of fasting, a period of ceremonial ritual, a period in which all good things were done and given and the people were brought back again into peace and harmony. Also, all grudges between nations or tribes within the state had also to be reconciled. There could be no more rumors of war. There could be no more uh, underhandedness. No spies or saboteurs could remain. And so strong and complete was the belief of these people that it was not violated. And one of the amazing things is that it was rare indeed that any one of them ever had to be punished. This was part of their code, that they should meet the new years, the new order of life, each 52 years, with a brand new clean world, in which everything that would hurt or hinder or retard was gone. Now these ideas did not originate, I do not think, with these people. They say that they did not. They tell us that this law was given to them by the seaman. And it's quite possible that we could open, by reflection and study, a strong case by which perhaps we could restore the judicial code of the common source or center of our cultures. A code which spread throughout the world with various modifications and ramifications but in the course of time was generally corrupted. But in some of these outlying regions where people remain very close to the old ways, perhaps the code was kept more completely, more intensely than it is, than it is to be found in other nations. If we did have, as Plato assures us there was, a great legislative or judiciary system in Atlantis, a rule by good laws. It is very possible that these laws became the basic tribal laws, which have always been strangely honored by wise people because of their extraordinary integrity. The same thing is true of the great laws of the uh, League of the Five Later Six Nations, uh, the great League of the Iroquois Peoples. Uh, it has been said that the, uh, it was said in Oxford University years ago that the code of the Iroquois is the highest moral ethical code known to man, higher than the code Justinian or the code of Hammurabi, the most exalted pattern of human conduct ever devised, and the wise ones at Oxford pointed out that it was given to us by a group of men wrapped in the skins of animals uh, sitting under a tree with a feather in their hair. Yet the wisdom of this code, the tremendous integrity of it, transcends us. And uh, Woodrow Wilson, in creating his League of Nations, which was built upon the League of the Iroquois Nation formula, used or incorporated into his points many of the essential elements of the Code Iroquois. This code also has this strange respect and veneration for the inevitable and immutable rights of men. It created a senate. The senators were called sachems. These senates, uh, senators were just exactly as representative of their people as any senator that we have, perhaps more so than most. There was one difference, however, in the League of Iroquois. No sachem or senator could be, uh, become in any way involved in a legislation relating to the province he represented. 
he could never vote for anything in which he had personal interest. Others had to vote for that. The second thing that was very interesting about him is that in the days of his tribal legislation, he was elected to office by what? By the vote of the women. Right, because the Iroquois nation was a nation of brood families. And in all brood families, the matriarch is the head of the family. She did not hold office, but she appointed the office holder, and he was responsible to her. Now that is, I think, very interesting, back before Columbus, in this poor, wretched Western world of savages. Another interesting and wonderful thing was the great league belt, which was the symbol of the league. The man carrying this league belt could go through any territory within the domains of the red man, and that belt was honored. Nothing could be done to it. A league belt of this quality was presented to William Penn as a sign by these Indians that they regarded him as worthy. And the symbol of the league belt was five men holding hands, the five nations. And the order of the league was, the great concept of the league was, all men under one roof. That one sky was over all men. That all men were brothers. That all men were equal before God. And that in this equality, it was the privilege of each man to protect the others. And no man should protect himself. Because if this was mutually fulfilled, others would be there to protect him. This concept was a great concept and a very old one. It did not begin with Daganawida, the founder of the League. He received it, in turn, from a mysterious being who came down on a cloud from a mysterious land beyond. He received it as having come from the Olds, from the great ones who were the guardians of his people. He received it as coming from the most ancient times, long before the rise of the Red Man on the Western Hemisphere. The Cone Iroquois could not have come from Hammurabi, it is a different code. It could not have come from any known code that we have today. Because there is no ancient code of primitive origin today that compares to it in any way. Therefore, it, it came down from the olds. It came down from some way that we do not know or understand. It came from some place which is forgotten. Now we might also bear in mind one other important tradition which links the Eastern Hemisphere with the Western and may very well also arise from your Atlantic complex. And that is the descent of what has sometimes been called natural magic. All primitive peoples share in mysterious powers which are lost to sophisticated peoples. They possess an instinctive hypersensitivity, if you wish to call it. Their religions and their rites have always been associated with magic. Plato tells us, and other ancient records affirm the same, that the secrets of transcendental magic were first disseminated from Atlantis. That here was the land of the old magic, the old arts, the necromantic arts, the arts of wizardry and witchcraft, the arts of demonology, which ultimately destroyed the island. Natural magic, however, whether it be good or ill, whether it be the sensitivity of the psychic or the medium, this tradition of the secrets of magic descending through certain orders of priests of ancient ones who received this tradition from time immemorial and accepted candidates into these practices only as the results of tests and initiations 
this structure exists on the Western Hemisphere just as much as it existed in uh, the Mediterranean region or in Asia. Therefore, these rites, these rituals, also have to have come from some common source. The great medicine lodge of the Ojibwe, the Midi ceremonials, are as complete a ritual of initiation as anything we find in Egypt, and almost identical. The candidate advances from the west to the east. He passes through certain rites and rituals. He is tried and tested. He passes through a ceremonial, uh, significant, symbolical death and resurrection. And he performed these ancient rites long before there was any known conduct, contact between Europe and America. These things, as Lapongeon and others have pointed out, seem to tell us beyond any reasonable doubt that at the root of time there was also the symbolic and significant belief that by certain disciplines and secret procedures, and the American Indian has his equivalent of yoga, that secret sciences and rites were possible. And just as surely as the East Indian fakir grows the mango tree, so your medicine priest in the Southwest grows his magical corn in a half an hour. These rites uh, were witnessed and described by the late Mr. Lummis, who was quite a character both in those parts and in these parts years ago. All of these uh, stories seem to show us, again, another continuity, did, the kind of continuity old Hostin Kla seemed to remember, the remembrance of old times and great things, the memory of a learning half forgotten, the memory of lands vanished, the memory of peoples who came out of the earth, maybe over the horizon, who knows, or out of lands submerged by mud and darkness, but always these people coming out of great danger, establishing themselves and building a world, this world not as great or not as glorious as what they had known, but gradually perhaps attempting, as the Mayas did, to climb back over this pyramid of the past and reconstruct it. The great patterns of the Mayan cities, their architecture, their art, their astronomy, their music, these things are not simply derived from neighboring peoples. They came from something deeper and richer. There is a great architecture in Central America. It is as great as anything we have in Egypt, but it is not the same. Where did it come from? It did not come from those Indians we know today. It came as they themselves believed, from records, from traditions, from the ancient help of their founding father, Itzamna, who brought them there, who had the knowledge, who helped them to restore their ancient rights. And then they were received, uh, or they received help the descent of these Quetzalcoatlers, of which there certainly was more than one. Mysterious feathered serpents, an order of priests or teachers. The first one remote, probably Atlantean. The others arising perhaps in intermediate areas. But bringing to them knowledge, great knowledge. And finally, as in the case of Quetzalcoatl, being driven back into the sea again by the Aztec god of fire. These legends will sometime have to unravel a great scientific knowledge which we have not today. These people knew the stars. They knew geometry. They were advanced in medicine. The Incas performed excellent trepanning on the brain and the patient recovered. There the Incas and Mayas both inlaid teeth with precious stones and did excellent dentures. These people were not savages. But when you ask them how they knew what they knew, how they had managed to preserve these skills, they can't tell you. They can only say that this we were told. These knowledge, this knowledge came from our fathers, who possessed it, who knew these things. We do not know them. The great ones of long ago knew them, and we are their children. And we have received these monuments as a heritage. We do not even know who built them. But they were built by the gods. They were built by the great ones who walked the earth in the dawn of time. 
These are their monuments, therefore we know they were here. These are their footprints, so we shall not deny that they have passed this way. We do not know who this Quetzalcoatl is, that accompanied by a singing band of craftsmen marched from the land of the seven colors. We do not know how it is that he taught us to work precious metals and precious stones and make images for our gods and adornments for ourselves, and how he set up great craftsmen, and how he created a wonderful school of craftsmen at Cholula. And here they taught all kinds of knowledge, of building, of architecture, of agriculture, of science, of medicine, of music. All these things were taught by these great ones, who then, singing and chanting together, walked away again, walked off into the sea, and were never seen again. <laughs> these legends from so many places cannot all be fabrications. They cannot all be merely imagining. Nor can a handful of modern enthusiasts be said to have invented them. They did not. Perhaps in some cases the modern enthusiast has exaggerated uh, what the information was that he had to work upon, but he did not invent it. Because each in turn refers to his sources, and these sources are valid. And these sources seem to tell us, beyond any question of doubt, that sometime in the past, that a structural system, a cultural system, such as that referred to by Plato, most certainly could have existed, probably did exist, and that from it has descended the scattered remnants of isolated cultures that we know today. That sometime we will put the pieces together again. For what nature has broken apart, nature will again unite. And in the course of our scientific searches through the centuries ahead, we will ultimately uncover the evidence to tell how this cultural motion existed, where it came from, and who was behind it. But until some better explanation or more adequate formula is found, we may consider with thoughtfulness and with care, not with quick acceptance, not with gullibility, but with thoughtfulness, the fact that there is a strong, reasonable case for the existence of a great culture that disappeared from the world 12,000 years before the Trojan War. If we place that culture where they believed it to be, we can then put all these parts together and have a structure that is meaningful. And until some better solution is found, I think we are entitled to view this with some favor as a probability. Now I think our time is up as usual, so we've covered as much ground as we could.